All right. So this is um, this is day one of four that we're going to be doing this midterm review. Um, your midterm, please keep in mind, it is on the 20th. That'll be the last day you're here at school. I'll be your first period of the day. That means you have to be in this room early. I know you don't want to be here early, but you have to be here early. And there's bless even you. a rule that says, bless you, there's a rule that says if you don't show up in time, I don't have to let you into the room to sit for your exam. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not, because you might start this thing and not finish, which would be more of a headache, because that means I have to stick around for the extra hour to like do that, and I don't feel like doing that. So um, I would probably make you come and sit for your exam um, during a teacher work day, a day that you weren't supposed to be at school anyway. So show up, be here, please be on time. Um, I'll try to have some sneaky snacks for you that day too. Yeah, so, um, all right, let's do this thing. Oh wait, let me break down your... Um, yeah, it's, it's actually recording audio. So uh, here's a few things, okay? Um, I expect this exam uh, to be made up of 100 questions. Okay, hit me with them faces. Um, so like I said, a majority of the stuff is gonna be pulled for the recent things that we've done. Um, but let me just break it down for you. So on this exam, I would expect 98, well actually, let me change that, 99 multiple choice questions. Now let me try that again, 79. <laughs> try, try, trying here, I'm trying. Um, other 20 are going to be matching, and those are going to be vocab from unit four. Not 30, but only 20. Okay, so yay. Okay, and you're probably saying to yourself, uh, multiple choice, 79 questions. Hey, what? Um, I would expect 40 of these to be from unit four. I would expect the other 39 to be from all previous units. <laughs> Which I'm pretty sure means most. But anyway, all previous um, um, topics. Um, you also will notice there's one extra question floating around out there. That's the essay question. Notice how I only said one essay question. This will also be pulled from unit four. Now, you remember me previously telling you there is a chance for extra credit on this thing. And that will be in the form of another essay. And oh my gosh, are you ready for this? I hope you are. It will be one of your previous essay questions. Which one? I won't tell you. But you have literally copies of all of those sitting in your folders because all of your part ones from your test, I return them back to you. So you have them available to you. So it'll be one of those, um, and that's all extra credit. So there's no penalty if you don't do it. There's only a gain if you try, which by the way, if you write anything in English, I'm gonna give you at least one point. So you can get up to 10 extra credit points and you already have access to what those potential question problem uh, problems are. They're 10 points, oh my gosh. That could change the letter grade of your test if you just view a previous essay question, there's just one. Yes. I, I am, I am the best teacher. So you have your extra credit opportunity. You know what your test is gonna look like. How do you feel? Are a majority pulled from unit four? Yes. Also, and I was talking to Amber about this earlier, um, of these four, uh, 40 multiple choice questions pulled from unit four, a good number of them will be actual genetics questions, as in like practice problems. And I, I'm not going to have you like, I'm not going to have you write out a Punnett square and like me grade those. Come on. Come on, kid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you still multiple choice answers. You got to work through the problem, but one of your answers will match up with what you do for the problem. How's that sound? Wow. So practice problems are brown. Uh, practice problems are pretty easy, I think. So yeah, you got to know some concepts and stuff like that. But I would guess a lot of a good a good chunk of these unit four problems 
are probably going to come from things like the cell cycle, mitosis, and meiosis, right? Right? This seems manageable, don't you think? I think so, too. So that's the breakdown for your test. Do you guys have any questions? You're sure? Okay. Let's go way back in time. Way, way back in time. We'll talk about chapter one. Yeah. It was a while ago. Oh, boy. So um, there are a few main concepts that were brought up. Um, in this area. Um, if you guys have your previous study guides, you can definitely use those to reference this. Um, I would tell you that a few things that I really like, I'm winking. If you're listening to this online, I'm telling you right now, I'm winking like a crazy person. Um, a few topics that I really like <laughs> that would be from chapter one would be things like emergent properties. You guys remember emergent properties? So what we're saying is we build complexity. In systems. OK, and this happens all the time. If like genetics, we're talking about it now. What a perfect example of an emergent property showing up in nature there, right? We have only five different nucleotides that are even available for us to use. And usually for DNA, we only use four. Somehow these four different letters can arrange themselves to make all of the traits that make you up. So from four things, we get like infinite numbers of possibilities of other things. Even all organisms share DNA. Wow, so bananas and strawberries are different than animals like giraffes and, ant and humans, right? So that's an emergent property. So be able to recognize when those show up. Um, I also like the idea of this one. This is a really big one. Um, structure equals function. So the structure of a thing determines what it can actually do. Um, we discovered this really well whenever we were doing biological molecules. So we were talking about, oh, well, like the structure of this molecule explains why it does what it does. Like the properties of water can be explained from the structure of water, right? Its shape, um, its polarity influences how it interacts with other molecules. That's a big concept. The shape of some cell organelles, like the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, whether it be smooth or rough, it all has like a lot of folds. The mitochondria, the chloroplasts, they all have a lot of folded up areas, a lot of com compartmentalization that influence what it can actually do. That's why it all takes place in the thylakoid membrane or the, or the, mito uh, the mitochondrial membrane. That's why it's all taking place there. So structure equals function. Um, you should also know about feedback mechanisms. So we have two versions of that. We have positive, we have negative. <clears throat> so can somebody very kindly remind me what a negative feedback loop is and what a positive feedback loop is? Yes. So yeah, we basically, make end product that slows down, oh, slows down further production, okay? But with positive feedback, it's the exact opposite, right? So the end product stimulates more production. And that's the most simplified like way to express that. Are you guys familiar with it? Do you have questions on it? Do you, anything I've talked about so far? Natalie's in full trance mode. Yeah, she's ready. Nothing. <laughs> OK. Um, I cannot because it, it will delete what is there. Sorry, positive and negative feedback. 
That was the last things that were written. Sorry, I can't go back. It's like, okay. Anyway, um, the other thing I want to mention is just the nature of science. Um, just try to keep in mind a few things, guys. Like, um, science doesn't like work to prove anything. It works to disprove things. So uh, the onus of proof is really on the experimenter um, to show like, no, 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 I've gone through all other means and I keep getting these same results. If you guys remember, remember there's a, a thing to experimental design. <laughs> right? We said experiments have to have these things, they're controls. Right, we have um, usually referred to as a control group, by the way. We have constants. We have independent variables. And we have dependent variables. Okay, um, you should be familiar with, they are, with, with what they are. Does anybody need me to review what they are? No, okay. I'm trying to slow down because I know you guys will have a, a, a like a panic attack if I if I just do it again. So yeah, constants. Um, so a constant is something that remains the same throughout the experiment, what what whatever test group it is. Um, so these are the things that uh, we're we're building in and we're accounting for. So basically, we're saying we're not changing this. Dependent res uh, are the results of the experiment, right? So we can't really change these unless we change something else, which would be the independent variable, which is the factor of change. Sometimes it's called the uh, the manipulated variable. So if I'm, what's the uh, one I used all the time? Like watering plants, yeah. So I have a bunch of seeds um, that are like in different pots of soil and like put them out in the light for the same amount of time. All that stuff is the same. The only thing I change would be the amount of water that I give each one. Um, that would be the independent variable. All the other things, though, Caitlin, those would be constants. The temperature of the area, the amount of light exposed, the kind of soil they're in, the pH of the soil they're in, the nutrients that are given to them. All the other things that remain exactly the same for each test group um, would be the same. So all factors that are the same. Yes, ma'am. It says factor of change. <clears throat> so all factors that remain the same word. word and the control group just has no independent variable which i'm just going to say iv for short those are like the major things from chapter one and i'm like yeah yeah I'd, i might ask him a question on those things and that's just chapter one doing okay i'm doing i'm doing pretty good i'm doing pretty good do I need to slow down more? I'm hovering. I'm just going to like you know, read ahead. That's, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to read ahead. I'm not delaying. I'm just reading ahead, guys. No, I'm reading. I'm reading. There's words. I say thanks. I read. Don't judge me, Ashley. Straight here, Ashley. Who are you? How about can I can I hit a button now? No? Yes? Thumbs up if I can go forward. All right, that's enough thumbs up. Okay, so chapter two. Chapter dose, as I like to call it, because I'm so cool like that. I'm so cultured. I'm a world traveling jet setter. Um, I ride in limousines everywhere. So um, a few things. Chinops, chinops, chinops. Do you guys remember what this stands for? Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, ugh, oxygen, phosphorus. I'm just going to say phosphorus because I'm getting lazy. And sulfur. These are the six main components of living things. 
the most common atoms found in living things? <coughs> there they are. You need to know that. And they go from most common to least common. Okay? So carbon is number one. Why? Because it bonds with just about everything. Carbon's super, super important. Like carbon is why molecules form. There's not many that we have in our body that don't have at least a carbon backbone, at least one carbon atom that allows all the other things to fit to it, right? So this is like a basics in like the beginners of, of uh, chemistry. So you guys do remember how many covalent bonds can carbon make? What do you think? You're right, it is four. So carbon can make four covalent bonds. That's really important for you to know because that, that can explain a lot of the atomic structures that we look at. Um, and yeah, that does mean it can double bond with things sometimes or even triple bond, oh my gosh. Uh, but that's pretty rare. It's, it's exceedingly rare. Usually carbon just takes a four carbon bond. Those would be covalent bonds. Okay, I hope I don't need to review like the structures of an atom, protons, neutrons, electrons. Does anybody want me to do that real quick though? No, we're good. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and jump ahead and talk about those different types of bonds, right? We talked about covalent bonds. We talked about ionic bonds. We talked about hydrogen bonds. And we even mentioned some weaker forces. Um, I'm going to hope I spell this right. I wrote it down, so. Nope, it's just two A's. Okay, so covalent bonds, ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, and van der Waals forces. Um, do you guys remember anything about covalent bonds? Yes. Uh, you're you're on to something. These are when they share electrons. Now they can do it in two ways, though. You're right. There's actually two versions. There's something called a nonpolar and a polar. Oh boy. Yeah, um, I was going to do um, covalent because it's a nonpolar covalent bond and a polar covalent bond. But I think you understand that because that's under this category now. So nonpolar basically means, uh, polar and nonpolar mean if they share them equally or not equally. Which one shares equally? Nonpolar. And then polar shares um, unevenly, okay? Um, so we talk about one of the most uh, common, most important uh, polar covalently bonded um, uh, molecules out there, which would be water. Because you guys will remember water forms like this up, upside down Mickey Mouse looking shape. Um, and that's because overall this side has a more positive charge, this side has a more negative charge. So um, that would be a really good example of a polar molecule, which we'll talk about um, more in a here in a second. But anyway, ionic bonds, what do we know about those? Yeah, you give up or you gain um, electrons, okay? Um, just to point out, you can be two different kinds of ions. You can be a cation or you can be an anion. Which one is positive, which one is negative? There you go, yeah. Cations are positive, anions are negative, which means if you've lost electrons, and remember electrons are negatively charged, you become a cation. Because yes, cats have paws, and they're positive. Oh, it's adorable. So, give up or gain electron. I just wrote ELE with a little minus sign, because it's a negative electron. 
I, I think it really enhances. That's what I was going for. Uh, electrons? No, it's not. But I think it emphasizes it. Yeah. Yeah, it's really emphasized there. Okay, so a hydrogen bond, what can you tell me about that one? They are weak, I'll give you that. But it's a weak attraction between You guys are on it. Yeah, good. So a weak attraction between a uh, negatively charged, and I'll say um, it's either an oxygen or a nitrogen of one molecule um, towards the hydrogen of another molecule. I'm trying really hard. I really am. Yeah, you can get closer. Okay. Do you want to move up front and then she'll sit right behind you? Anyway, then we have Van der Waals forces. <clears throat> Van der Waals forces are another weak attraction. But it's a weak attraction between um, polar and nonpolar uh, molecules. Okay? So it's an attraction between two, those two different things. Maggie, are you with me? You are? It's hard to believe. So I'm just I'm just doing this for fun. Yeah. yeah, you should you should probably pay attention. Yeah, thank you. So, um, do you guys have any questions on stuff uh, from chapter two here? No. Uh, go ahead. Hydrogen bonds are between particular atoms. So you can see that I mentioned nitrogen and oxygen. That's going to be negatively charged, and the positive uh, the positive hydrogens have to be attracted in that problem. Um, for other things, you know, you could have polar and nonpolar molecules that are attracted to each other, um, but they might be really big, complex things. You could have two nonpolar uh, substances attracted to each other, but one might have an overall positive charge, one might have a negative charge. So that could cause an attraction there. So it's, uh, I would say a hydrogen bond is a more specific kind of linking there. Any questions there? No? All right, can I hit the button? Because if I do it, it goes away. No objections? No objections. So chapter three. Chapter three is pretty great. Talked about properties of water. Uh, namely through that thing of polarity. Um, can somebody explain what polarity is, especially with, let's say, a water molecule? Right, that's a polar covalent bond, and that's the bond that connects these two here. So this causes that uneven sharing of electrons, which overall means we end up with a positive charge here and a negative charge there. Um, just to remind you, this means we have electrons swirling around in these atoms, right, in these atomic structures. Um, when we look, um, there's only one electron available in each of these hydrogens, um, but it's getting pulled towards the middle here because this oxygen is so greedy. It just pulls it away, which means there's only one proton left behind. Um, and since that little positive end is staying on that side of the molecule more often, that's why it overall has a more positive charge. Um, which means it readily forms hydrogen bonds, which um, means um,
to gives all the special properties to water, right? Yeah, so um, we have a few cool things that we know. Um, we said um, there's cohesion. Where's my, where's my thing? Where is it? Cohesion, what's that do? Water likes water. Um, it would be true. You could phrase it for any substance as long as it's attracted to another version of itself. Um, that's cohesion. Then we have adhesion. Okay, good. Water attracted to other things. It could be anything, but it's got to be attracted to it. Um, kind of the same capacity that we see for cohesion, just other stuff. Um, we also said it does some um, interesting things. Um, it has lower density. when it's frozen, which causes ice to do what when it's mixed with water? Causes it to float because it's got less density. It causes it to rise. Um, also, it does something cool when it's frozen. It expands. Um, that expansion causes its lower density because we're saying all the water molecules are getting evenly spaced and they're they're spacing out to a pretty huge limit. Um, so they, they increase their volume and, and take up more space. Um, and then we said it's considered having a high heat of vaporization, or conversely, you could even say high heat of, nobody? Yeah. No, it, it, it is a property. Um, by, if you look at the structure of water molecules bonding to other water molecules, it's limited, it's limited to making four hydrogen bonds as well, um, which would explain the hydrogen bonds are because of the polarity, which says hydrogen bonds are accounting for that. Expansion. No, it's, it's there. Um, and then, oh, it's a really versatile solvent. Um, we used to be able to get away with saying the universal solvent, but we can't anymore. So it's a very versatile solvent. Yeah? Yeah? I'm not delaying, I'm just reading. <laughs> oh, poo. Haley's got it. She's got it. Not that one, that other one. Goodbye, Dustin. Goodbye, Dustin. You're checking out. Okay. So, do I need to do anything? Do I need to go over anything? You sure? Okay. I'm moving on. Four. Um, chapter four, we covered a good amount of stuff here, and good for you. Um, I'm not going to go as in-depth as we did last time. So I would tell you, I already mentioned the four covalent bonds things. Um, I want you to be able to at least identify what an organic molecule is. What is an organic molecule? Bye, Dustin. What's an organic molecule? Yep. Um, as carbon. Um, and what experiment helped support the claim that or the discovery of organic molecules? Yeah. The Miller Urey experiment. Which you'll remember they discovered that they could make organic molecules from non organic sources. Um, that was the one that they had like a giant ga a glass chamber and there was water like being boiled with a lot of hot like 
boiling hot water um, that's being cooked up. And then there's another chamber that has like uh, nitrogen gas and like carbon monoxide or car carbon dioxide, um, but it had no oxygen gas, just no oxygen gas. And then they ran an electrode through there and went zzz, like lightning. And then from that mixture with the water, it was able to condense and land it in that water pool. And they were able to trap organic molecules. Like we were like, holy crap, we can do it. And they basically made amino acids, um, which is pretty important. So a uh, little summary there. We also said um, there are things out there called isomers. I'm going to tell you. Um, you should just be able to identify, um, the different ones. Um, and I would tell you, can you tell me the difference between structural and geometric? I'm just saying, like, if I was writing a midterm, it's not like I am. Right. Um, I would probably want to look for those things in particular. Can you identify the difference between structural and geometric isomers? Yeah. And isomers are just like rearrangements of the same atoms into a different shape, but it still makes a similar molecule. Um, we even talked about how there's like enantiomers and all kinds of stuff like that. I'm only going to ask you about structural and geometric isomers. Um, Um, I'm going to tell you this. Remember your functional groups? Remember those? I'm only going to ask you up to three of them. Would you like to know which three? Yeah. Hydroxyl, amino, and carboxyl. Okay. I like it because carboxyl was basically a hydroxyl and a carbonyl put together. So carboxyl is a nice example. So if I ask you any questions on functional groups, it'll only be on those three. And it'll mostly be, which one is, what? what is this? What is this? A, is this a carbonyl? Or I'm sorry, carboxyl, a hydroxyl, an amino? You should be able to identify it at a glance. So you need to look at those. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you guys have any questions there? I'm not delaying. I'm just reading. I should what? I should I should have my own YouTube channel and do what? Oh, uh, you could never replace Bozeman. You can. Yeah. 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 It's true. I got a better ring than my whole thing. I agree. It's true. It's all about advertising, guys. Okay, can I do chapter five stuff now? No, nope, I'm just going to doodle puppies. And I'm going to be like, I'm the science guy, huh? <laughs> Old analogy, guys. All right, so. Um, you should know some things about carbohydrates. Yes, it, yes, it is. Chapter, chapter five. Yep. Uh, so we have carbohydrates. Remember, they're always written in that one to two to one ratio, and that's always carbons to hydrogens to oxygens. So it's a ratio. So if you were to look at a question, it's like we had previous questions that did this. You looked at a question and said, oh, is this, what kind of molecule is this? And if you saw C6H12O6, 6 to 12 to 6, that's a one to two to one ratio. So that tell you that it's a carbohydrate. If you saw those numbers get bigger, that would explain something. But, um, yeah, basically, we use this for energy. Right? Right. Um, and it's usually broken down 
for ATIP, ATP, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we got lipids. Man, we're, we're not going real deep, are we? Yeah. Well, then, I think he's the patron saint of biology. I don't know. I, I just, it's, tr it's triple double equal. So, uh, lipids, they are made up of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. But, dude, you should be super, super, super aware um, that you're going to see a lot of carbons and hydrogens that make them up. Um, usually, we call that a fatty acid tail. It's a chain. And it looks like this, if you ever see it drawn on anything. Because these are all like carbons, 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 carbons. And we assume two little H's are coming off of each one of these. You guys remember this? Okay. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're saying. Yeah? So lipids, they store energy. And we're saying that's like long-term storage. It ain't no short-term stuff. Um, it can also be used for structure. Anybody know a good example of it being used for structure? The cell membrane. It's a really good example. Yeah, it's a double layer. It's two la layers of phospholipids. Good. Um, can I click the button or you guys got to do a thing? Do your thing. Uh, I still have a good chunk of chapter five to get through. It was a detailed chapter just because it breaks down these things, but I'm not delaying. I'm just reading. Notes, prepared notes, kids. If I were you, I would probably expect at least a question on each of these macromolecules. <laughs> sure, yeah. Did you say sure, Jan? Yeah, I did. You bet I did, Jan. Sure, Jan. Everyone's Jan now. Sure, Jan. That's true. I am. Sure, Jam. Can I hit the button now? We have new things out there called nucleic acids. Still chapter five. Um, you should remember these are made up of things called nucleotides. They link together. to form DNA or ah! Okay, we're back. So nucleic acids, they're made up of things called nucleotides, and they form your DNA and your RNA, right? Right. Um, you should just kind of have this out there. Um, there are different forms of DNA, and we kind of briefly talked about some of them, but there is mitochondrial DNA. There's also things like messenger RNA or DNA. Um, no, it's RNA. What am I? What am I saying? That's RNA. There's a uh, ribosomal RNA. Which are, by the way, written like mRNA and rRNA. 
Yeah, those are parentheses. Deal with it. Um, I'm transfer aren't I? Yeah. Those are all things you should be aware of, like they exist. Last ones are proteins. Made up of amino acids, right? Um, try to keep in mind, there are like, like 20 amino acids out there that make up all the proteins that we need and use. Um, but they are created from transcribed genetic material. Um, and they are pretty much the most functional, most, most functional molecule in organisms. Okay? Um, which leads us to our last things, but I'm just reading. Just reading, just reading ahead. Hey, I, hold on a second, I'm reading. Oh, okay, I, I read it. What, what's your question, Stuart? Oh, yep. Yep. Yeah, just, sure? just, I'm not delaying, I'm just Are reading. Really no. <laughs> no. When I was a kid, I could do a headstand. When I was a kid, I could do a headstand. No. It's one of the great faults in my life is I can't do a cartwheel. I bet you can. Can I, can I move on? Any objections from me hitting the button? Okay, so this brings up a really important topic. Enzymes. While they're important, we are still in chapter five. Yeah, uh, Jan. So, um, these, are, these are basically proteins in most cases, but they're affected by and we're kind of running out of time, so I'm going to go quick. They're affected by pH, temperature, and the rate of their activity can also be affected by their concentration. Now, previously, previously when you learned about enzymes, you learned about like the lock and key model. Well, that still is kind of nice. It helps us like learn some functionality. The truth is, it's not what it really looks like. And um, we use this thing called induced fit. And the induced fit model basically says like, we sometimes butter up the enzyme to change its shape to make sure the substrate can fit to it, um, to fit to its active site. Uh, I would tell you, you should probably, if I were you, I'd be aware of non-competitive inhibition. Versus, um, I guess, com com competitive, yeah. So... Uh, non-competitive and competitive means this blocks the active site. Yeah, so it basically influences uh, the shape of the enzyme. Um, but not on the active site. Uh, influences. No, that's where the substrates fit onto the enzyme. Yeah. Yeah, so like there's a, I don't know, it's like goofy drawing. But. Okay, so if we're saying there's a molecule that's going to fit somewhere, 
and it's going to fit here. This is called the active site. Yeah, so they, these are called substrates. Um, this is called the enzyme. And when you put them together, that's called the enzyme substrate complex. What an original name, huh? Um, but if you have an induced fit, uh, I'm sorry, a non-competitive inhibitor, we're saying it'd like fit over here, which would kind of change the shape of this thing, which means it won't work anymore. Yeah, the competitive one would be like, I'm going to fit here and stop anything from fitting in there. Yeah. Can't work either. So you should be able to tell the difference between those two. You guys doing okay? Yeah. Um, just also a heads up, if you see um, something ending in the letters A-S-E, that's probably an enzyme. 